Welcome, listeners, to www.ironradio.org, the website and podcast for all things strength sports and sports nutrition. With your hosts, Lonnie Lowry. Remember, Phil is like a gnarled old oak tree held together with scar tissue and bone spurs. Rob Fortney. And I'm telling you, the pain that I would suffer was ex- beyond excruciating. And Phil Stevens. Do it, Rob. You'll kill all those nerves. Thanks for listening. Good morning, everybody. Go to strengthguild.com. S T R E N G T H G U I L D.com. Scroll down to the Iron Radio Collections and we've got new shirts and new banners for you to support the show. Everything from just a regular banner, regular shirt, to ones with sayings on them, like Lonnie's Phil is like a gnarled old oak tree shirt. And some news for you we're going to have some contests for people who own these shirts and things. So if you support the show, we'll let you more on that later. So if you get in on these early, you can be one of the per- first people to win some prizes. So, thank you very much. Go check out the site, strengthguild.com. Scroll down to Iron Radio Collections and support the show. Merry Christmas, everybody. This is Lonnie Lowry. I am an exercise physiologist and a licensed nutritionist, and I'm a former competitive bodybuilder. I was going to do my Phil impersonation, but I'm not very good at it. So, <laughs> <laughs> this is Dr. Mike T. Nelson. Phil's away at a cabin or a swamp or somewhere doing whatever. Uh, associate professor at Kerrig Institute, created the Flex Diet Cert and Physiologic Flexibility Cert, just wrapping up grading finals. Nice. Yeah, I've actually yeah. been away from that for about a week and a half. I put in a floor in my bathroom. It looks okay for an amateur. I'm, you know, covering my amateur skills with caulk. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, but I just needed that, like a change of pace. You know, I'm sure, I mean, it's that sort of just being able to build something and stand back and look at it, it's really not that different from probably what drew me to bodybuilding, you know, is build something worthwhile. I don't know. Yeah, so. I have that on my list. I've got a, a hydrofoil kit that I need to fiberglass, and then once I get that done, see if I can ride it. And then my eventual goal is to uh, fiberglass a surfboard and kind of make one from scratch. Wow. That's cool. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, gotta wait till spring because it's too cold in the garage now. <laughs> oh, totally! I hear you. I, I'm running back and forth to the garage. And all right, uh, everybody, not to bore you, but we've got some news coming down the pike um, about dietary components that don't get much attention and might be damaging you in your training gains. We're going to talk a little bit about the connection between diet and sleep again from some new uh, material that's circulating through the New York Times. Uh, And then after the break, we're just going to have a simple topic. What do you want for Christmas? And when I say Christmas, listen, I'm not, you know, happy Hanukkah. uh, Pick pick your holiday, right? Happy holidays. (laughs) But it's not um, a slight against anyone. I mean, academia, you know, we're always so politically correct. Um, My family celebrates Christmas. To be honest, I'm not hyper-religious, but the intention uh, is good. And that's what I mean. So... Uh, whatever holiday you follow, we'll talk about when, what are some of the gifts that you're hoping for related to health and strength and, and why. Yeah, so I'll just ask Mike some stuff, maybe supplements, you know, uh, training stuff, anything on your list, because this is going to be the Christmas episode, because next Saturday we will be a day post-Christmas already. So, all right, let's start with uh, the Fall and Holiday Funds Drive. I just wanted to say thank you to those who have donated. It's a big deal. Uh, We have some plans behind the scenes. Phil is actually working on something to increase the interactivity. I know a lot of you just like to donate and listen to the podcast, but let's face it, if you want to interact with us, other than leaving a comment on our YouTube channel um, for some of our food videos that we put up in the fall, uh, there's not a lot of chances for our listeners to interact. So if you want to do something forum related, we'll say, uh, then it's going to be a real opportunity for everybody. So, and if you're already a subscriber, uh, like a ongoing supporter of Iron Radio, we're going to grandfather you in so you can use that additional thing. We don't want to nickel and dime people for each, you know, little Iron Radio related thing. Because when it comes down to it, we're a medium sized club, if you will. I mean, by some YouTube and, and podcast standards, we're tiny, but. You get the idea. But there will be new things coming down the pike, and that's why those $4 monthly supporter donations are a big deal. But I always hate when I listen to YouTube and people ramble on about subscribe and, 
you know, click the like button. And so I don't want to go mm-hmm. on. Let's get to the meat of it then. Uh, let's see. First, I want to touch on one um, that just doesn't get much attention at all. And there was actually a very good piece written. I got this through Healthline.com from uh, Mary Jane Brown. She's a PhD RD like I am. She's from the UK. Strength and Muscle Sport News. Um, what are advanced glycation end products or AGEs? Uh, now, before we hit the record button, everybody, Mike and I were just talking. Uh, for ages, I've been wanting to write an article called What May I Eat? Right? Because don't eat carbs, don't eat fats, you know, uh, mm-hmm. don't eat processed foods. Here, this is sort of similar to that. Don't eat AGEs. There's so many things you're told not to eat. You know, don't eat plants. Don't eat meats. I mean, so what's left? You know, it becomes very frustrating. And I think the point of it is an avoidance approach like that leads to some level of failure and guilt in a lot of people, or at least stress. So I'm a big fan of approach strategies. But in any case, let's talk about AGEs here. And then I can ask uh, Dr. Nelson for his input. Again, we're going to be real nerdy other than the Christmas stuff because... You know, when Phil's away, we're like, woohoo! Yeah. You know, Phil's not here to cross check us, right? <laughs> right. Like, I don't see that in my gym, you guys. <laughs> I can't see an AGE, right? <laughs> uh, especially when I tell him not to eat grilled chicken. That's not going to go over big. <laughs> grilled meats, you know. Um, so, basically, it starts off by saying studies have found that advanced glycation end products may have powerful effects on your metabolic health. Um, This isn't just something that your body generates. Of course, it's something you can consume in the diet, right? These glycated proteins. Like if some of you are familiar, if you've got metabolic syndrome, which is prediabetes, or you know somebody with diabetes, they might be not just checking their blood sugar, but occasionally using a little finger prick meter, going to the doctor and having their glycated hemoglobin checked. And all that means is it gets little sugar residues attached to it. Think about like gummed up red blood cells, if you will, if your blood sugar is always running high. But it's not just people with prediabetes or diabetes that have these problems. It does make it worse. Um, But it says AGEs accumulate naturally as you age, uh, and they're created when certain foods are cooked, especially at high temperatures. And later we're going to see that especially dry heat creates a lot of this. Now, what's frustrating to many of you might be that, and, and me too, is browning foods seems to do this. It's related to the Maillard reaction where you get, you know, carbohydrates and proteins sort of bonding and making this brown, delicious, you know, grilled tasty. look. Yeah, taste baked. Um, so it's what makes food delicious. And yet, you know, it's like the more you live, the faster you will die, right? Because if you indulge in those things. So I think for all of us, uh, just to kind of almost jump to a conclusion at the end, it's going to be, you're going to have to pick and choose which one of these things, the benefits outweigh you know, the the risk of them being high in AGEs. And I'm going to go down a food list for you so you can kind of cash in on some gold nuggets. Anyway, it says diet is the biggest contributor to AGEs. Now, your body does have mechanisms to fight the, you know, pro-oxidant and inflammatory effects that these AGEs induce. You have, you know, enzymes and, and whatnot to try to deal with it. Uh, But often your body can't keep up, especially if your diet is very high in these advanced glycation end products. And again, nobody wants to live in a state of excessive oxidative stress and inflammation. So diet has been linked to this, of course, especially regarding diabetes, but also heart disease, kidney failure. Like if you have kidney Mm -hmm. problems, because if you think about like when I worked in the on the transplant floor uh, at the Cleveland Clinic many years ago, uh, just when I was an intern, I noticed that a lot of the people that were getting kidneys, they had had high blood pressure and diabetes for a long time. And that just wreaks havoc on the glomerulus, you know, the whole kidney filtering whole apparatus. Structure. Yeah, yeah, it gets gummed up and the basement membrane gets thickened and you get, you know, worst case, you get this like onion skin hyperplasia. It's bad news. And so, you know, people would, you don't feel the high blood pressure. You don't feel... Uh, pre-diabetes or even, you know, early stage diabetes in a lot of cases. So, you know, you ignore it and then your your filters for your bloodstream are screwed. Uh, so anyway, also Alzheimer's is on this list as well as premature aging. 
So, um, at Mike pointed out, but again, I'm being a little redundant, but before we hit the record button, that, of course, you're much worse if you run high blood sugars in all of this. But again, we want to focus on diet and consuming these things uh, directly. So here are some of the things that are risky. And again, take this with a grain of salt because I'm not telling you not to eat all of these things. I might tell you not to eat processed foods uh, much, but barbecuing is on this list of no-nos. Grilling, roasting, baking, frying, broiling, and toasting. So any heat. <laughs> Right, right. Like is what's... boiling on there? That might be the only safe thing. I didn't know if I heard oh, that. No, searing is, sauteing is, um, no, not boiling. So there you go. Live, okay. live a bland, oh, boiled. Back to my boiled chicken breast. Right. <laughs> um, uh. It says these cooking methods may make food taste, smell, and look good. No, so she does acknowledge that. Uh, she goes on to say, though, dry heat may increase the amount of AGEs by 10 to 100 fold compared to uncooked foods. But again, what are you gonna eat everything raw? I'm not. So foods highest in AGEs, let's give you a little list here, but it can be confusing because some of these things are unhealthy and some are healthy from other perspectives, right? Other nutrient perspectives. Um, certain cheeses, uh, red meats. They always gotta throw that in there, don't they? They always have to slay yep. red meat. Uh, fried eggs, butter or margarine, mayo, oils, and nuts. Mm. Well, of course, some oils, like olive oil, are yeah. great, and nuts are usually great for lots of reasons. Um, fried foods and highly processed products uh, are the ones that I would say be careful, right? If you have something yeah. fried in, you know, you get deep fried goodies and you know they're goodies. You know they're you know <laughs> a little sinful, if you will, um, processed stuff. And it's fried in crappy oils like corn oil or you know soybean oil stuff like that. I mean, I'm Mike. You, I think you're a little more down on soybean oil even than I am. Um, yeah, but I just find those high omega six the oils that are also just extremely processed to hell and back. If they can just hang out on your grocery shelf without anything going bad with maybe the exception of, of olive oil and saturated that are, you know, solid at room temperature. If they're liquid, eh, probably not the best idea. Yep. Yep. Uh, now linking this to aging, cause this is an opus that I'm just kind of reading through for the, the listeners here, but Alzheimer's again, related to aging arthritis. I'm feeling that high blood pressure. So there are other things that are also connected with this. And again, because of this pro-oxidative stress, this inflammation kind of thing over a long period, you don't always feel inflammation, right? Which is why every day I, I basically take triple strength fish oils and curcumin. I'm trying to limit oxidative stress and inflammation, especially because they're linked to aging and I am old. <laughs> um, <laughs> now, as far as a low AGE diet, uh, they they because you might say, well, is this all just association, right? Because so much of what we we often critique is the correlation does not equal causation. There have been several animal intervention studies that where they fed them a low AGE diet, and they did in fact have lower risk of insulin insensitivity, um, lower levels of AGEs in their blood in their tissues by up to fifty three percent. So you can change your tissue levels of these things. Uh, now you might say, well, that's just animals, but similar results were observed in people. They had reduced markers of oxidative stress and inflammation. And there's at least three references here for that. Uh, she also mentions, and again, just to give credit where it's due, this is that Mary Jane Brown, Dr. Brown. A one-year study uh, looked at a low AGE diet on 138 people with obesity, and they even lost some weight. So it helped their insulin sensitivity. And if you're not familiar, everybody, if you're sensitive to insulin, ideally then you are depositing the carbs you eat in muscle tissue as glycogen where it belongs. Uh, that kind of thing, instead of leaving it hanging out in your blood and gumming up everything. And in any case, uh, even a modest decrease in body weight. Uh, meanwhile, those in the control group that ate a high AGE diet, and again, this is a one year study with 138 people, um, they consumed more than 12,000 AGE kilo units per day. And so that's how we measure this. This is something we're keeping an eye on 
with all of this stuff, AGE killer units. Um, by the end of this study, the control group had higher AGE levels and markers of insulin resistance, oxidative stress, and inflammation. So there we go. Now, as I try to get through this here, so how much is too much? The average consumption in New York, at least, has been postulated to be 15,000 AGE kilo units per day. Hmm. Um, to get a rough idea of whether you're consuming too many, basically just think about how much grilled or toasted or roasted foods that you eat, including meats, solid fats, full fat dairy. Uh, again, I would focus on the highly processed foods because those are usually the ones that are less nutrient uh, dense anyway, nutrient rich. On the other hand, if your diet is loaded with fruits and vegetables, legumes, and low-fat dairy, you're likely to have lower AGE levels, so lower gummed-up you know, blood in other tissues. Uh, if you regularly prepare meals with moist heat, such as soup and stew, you'll actually get lower levels of AGEs. So if you love your you know, meat, instead of maybe grilling with dry heat, maybe you have a stew something like that if you're worried about this kind of stuff now here is more sous vide i guess yeah yeah uh the list eggs are kind of high fried eggs uh about 1200 uh on this uh you know scale if you will a scrambled egg not 1200 75 only and i think that's oh. because you're not you know basically frying it until it's a little brown around the edges and all that kind of thing now, here's what kills me. Three ounces of braised beef, 2,200. So 2,200. Uh -oh. uh, and then three ounces of grilled chicken, 5,200. Oh, you're going to take my grilled chicken? You know, That's for three ounces, not nine ounces or 12. <laughs> right, you know, good call, because that's what we're all eating probably. Yeah. So these AGE killer units, uh, some of these things are... Like I said, it's easy to point your finger at some of these things, and you could probably avoid them. French fries have about 700 on this scale. Uh, and again, these are things you want to keep the scale low. But I would just focus on the highly processed things like those fries. You know, try to keep up antioxidant-rich uh, foods. You know, she talks about laboratory studies showing vitamin C or quercetin. Quercetin. I'm not exactly – I struggled with that word for a decade and a half. Um <laughs> But um, if you, it, they show that if basically there's a, a, a positive, a beneficial connection with vitamin C and quercetin and reducing these things. Um, curcumin is on this list, which is in turmeric. In fact, next week, everybody, I'm going to talk a little bit about some very cool studies coming out on curcumin and strength and muscle mass. So very interesting stuff. I take a little bit of that myself. Uh, resveratrol. Right, which you see in the skins of dark fruits, grapes, raspberries, uh, things like that. I believe there's some in peanuts, uh, colorful fruits and veg. So an another reason to try to seek those antioxidants. Now, before I turn this over to uh, Miguel here, there's a 2018 paper I stumbled upon, unrelated. Um, this is Krishnamurti and colleagues from... Dis model mech, so disease model mechanisms, I suppose, but in 2018, dietary advanced glycation end product consumption leads to mechanical stiffening of murine intervertebral discs. So mouse study, sure, but again, they go on, it, it, they're t linking now these AGE uh, to back problems, especially in women, which I think was interesting. Back pain is a leading cause of disability, of course, strongly associated with intervertebral disc or IVD degeneration. Pro-oxidant and structure-modifying AGEs contribute not just to obesity and diabetes, uh, which are associated with back pain, um, but again, these AGEs accumulate in tissues due to hyperglycemia and ingestions of foods at high heat. And again, according to Dr. Brown, especially high and dry heat. Now, collagen-rich intervertebral discs are particularly susceptible to AGE accumulation because they have a slow metabolic rate, according to Krishnamurti and colleagues. Um, high AGE diet resulted in AGE accumulation in the IVDs uh, with increased compressive stiffness, torque range, and failure torque, particularly for females. 
These biomechanical changes were likely caused by significantly increased AGE crosslinks in the annulus fibrosis, uh, measured by multi-photon imaging. It says the greater influence of high AGE diet on females is an important area of future investigation that may involve AGE receptors that are known to interact with estrogen. We conclude that high AGE diets can be a source of IVD cross-linking and collagen damage in your intervertebral discs. Wow. Hmm. So that one kind of hit me, right? Because what power lifter doesn't, by the time they're middle-aged, doesn't think, oh, I feel a little stiff in my lower back, you know, um, yeah. kind of thing. Uh, so that's a that's a whirlwind tour of this, Mike. But what are your thoughts about AGEs and practical tips for listeners and stuff like that? Yeah, I mean, I think the the hard part is, I mean, by definition, if you're going to study AGEs as an intervention, like the studies you mentioned, you want to know, do they have really an effect, right? There's probably going to be less data on, oh, if I still eat these things, can I add a fair amount, like you mentioned, antioxidants to make up for it? Like mm -hmm. how much fruit and vegetable do I need to counteract it? That's probably less likely to, to be studied, so... Yeah, I think it's it's interesting. I, my fear is that there's going to be the anti-AGE diet book and people are going to be scared of, you know, eating meat and other stuff like that because, it, you know, we all know at the end of the day for most people, yeah, if you're super hardcore, you'll boil your chicken breast and eat it. I've done that many times. I think it sucks and it's a horrible way to eat your chicken breast. Yeah. <laughs> but... If, you know, if I'm working with just the average, you know, general population clients or even more motivated athletes and trainers, it's much harder to get someone to do something that they don't like doing, you know, so getting them to eat, you know, soggy broccoli and, you know, shoe leather chicken that was boiled just to reduce their AGEs, eh, I have to weight that against, okay, well, you're only getting 40 grams of protein a day now, <laughs> yes. you know, so kind of taking it and applying it and putting it into the big picture and, you know, if you're at a higher risk and your blood glucose is kind of uncontrolled, you're getting closer to being a diabetic and you're living on takeout food, then, yeah, I 100% agree. It's definitely going to be an issue and reduction of those things is going to move you in the right direction, too. But and that's that's always the hard part, too, looking at people who generally are exercise, they have other healthy habits. How much of that does making consumption of some AGEs, not, you know, mainlining them, probably less of an issue out of all the things for them to worry about. Yeah, I think about Phil and his abusive, almost bulk up diets, but they're not super abusive except in amount and calories because he he covers all of his bases with fruits and veg and all that. Then he layers, you know, the calories on top. And like you said, then you, you're getting a lot of those <laughs> Uh, natural food colors and fruits and veg, a lot of the antioxidants and stuff, how much of that, when you purposely consume or even supplement them, you yeah. know, counteracts the formation of these AGEs in your tissues. It's a good call. Yeah, and I wonder, I'd like, and I, I don't know the answer to this too, but I'd be super curious as to how much high, blue, high blood glucose environment and high insulin probably makes this exponentially worse would be my guess yes i would love to see a comparison in humans of you know someone with you know pretty tightly controlled blood glucose good glucose disposal insulin sensitivity all that fun stuff you know compared to someone who's kind of on a borderline type 2 diabetic or frank type 2 diabetic and my guess is you're probably going to see a pretty big difference in those groups yeah yeah just because their blood sugar is so high all the time you know right Right. Um, oh, I missed one off of our list. Even higher than grilled chicken is broiled steak at 6,600. Oh, crap. Uh, that's, I know, right? That's going to make a lot of people <laughs> sad. Like, that's what my holiday meals are, you know? <laughs> um, yeah, so, again, I, I get it. It's like a whole nother thing to try to um, worry about or avoid, and I don't like avoidance. I, did, I was going to ask you, Mike, because you've done so many of those fresh cadaver dissections and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what about the study from Krishnamurti in 2018 about AGE accumulation contributing to disc degeneration? Like I'm thinking lumbar spine, right? And heavy, heavy yeah. power lifters, you know? Yeah, I mean, we see like, I mean, I've been fortunate enough. I did my undergrad, we did uh, cadaver stuff. And then when I did my uh, search, 
PhD work for biomedical engineering, which I didn't finish that degree, but all the stuff I did was through the med school at the University of Minnesota. And then on three separate times, I've done that through Tom Myers at Anatomy Trains and Todd Garcia, where you have a whole week where you take a fresh uh, tissue dissection. So there's about six to eight people per cadaver. You can kind of look at whatever you want. Um, so seeing the fresh tissue stuff compared to a lot of the work I did before was embalmed is just completely different. Um, and the nice part about that course, too, is that there's probably eight to 15 bodies. So you can see a, a wide variety of stuff, too. And I don't know. I mean, my big takeaway from that related to spinal mechanics. And again, we don't know a lot of the pathologies of these people or what positions they were in or anything about them, really. You just get the impression by looking at how they are of just as they got older, I just don't think they moved a whole lot. And how everything just started getting just stuck in that position. Mm -hmm. And I think this happens probably earlier in, in the spine. And of course, your lumbar spine doesn't have a lot of movement. Your thoracic spine has a lot more movement. But even just myself and other people I see lifting, you can kind of get an idea of where they're getting all their movement from. Like a lot of times at the top part of the pelvis, just the low back, they're almost a little bit hypomobile there and then the rest is kind of frozen to get up to their thoracic which is kind of lost rotation so i just think about the lack of stimulus combined with you know other nutrition choices you know, you're probably going to see some change in structure and just stiffening and then the last part when i do hands-on work on on people here in minnesota i'll just feel up their back and check for uh, the rector spinae group and usually we're you'll see it uh, so we worked on some people this past weekend. The low back was yeah, muscle, but not a lot. Like you go up a little bit, a few segments, a lot of muscle, and then progressively less. So you could tell right where the most of their movement was from, they've got a lot more hypertrophy in that area. So trying to get them to be a little bit more, I guess you could say spread out with their their movement and not so concentrated on one area. Right. Now, related to gummed up and tissue damaged discs, um, because, you know, you're talking about tissue that's basically avascular, right? I mean, if, yeah. you, if you're not moving it and getting some compression and some kind of mushing fluids around in there, right, you got to think that that's just going to be a prescription to make this whole process even faster, right, the degeneration. Yeah, that would be my guess, too. And, I mean, we did take a few of the discs apart and... I, I don't know enough to look at it and say what was good and what was bad unless, you know, we saw a couple that were, you could tell, just completely destroyed <laughs> and have any of the the normal structure left. Oh. And then we saw some that looked really good. Um, so you definitely saw big differences in, in contrast, you know, between them. Even a lot of the other joints, too. Like we had one where the knee didn't move very well. And it turns out it was a restriction. It appeared to be in the skin. When we opened the knee, the inside of the knee was like perfect. We looked at another cadaver and the inside of the knee just looked like someone dumped gravel in it. It was just ooh, destroyed. Ooh. You know, so it it's interesting because you see differences on the outside, just range of motion. And then we had the ability to look inside. And yeah, it was it's pretty fascinating how you, you know, at the end of the day, you definitely see changes in the nervous system and you definitely see mechanical structural differences too so it's a neurobiomechanical model because i get annoyed with all these people that are like oh it's only the neurology side and then it's only the biomechanics it's like no it's it's both of them <laughs> yeah yeah just like movement it's movement and your nutrition and not moving a lot and sucking down a ton of ages probably not going to be very good for your your back Right. And, you know, it's a good point, too. We, we talk about, like, can you counteract AGEs with a lot of antioxidant-rich foods, anti-inflammatory spices or whatever. But exercise, of course, makes our listeners different. You know, it's a different population. If you're constantly exercising, your blood sugars and insulins are going to run lower, you know, if you did, like, continuous monitoring, stuff like that. Your dietary choices, too. But I'm just thinking, like, even exercise alone like you said, you can't separate these things. They're interconnected, you know. Sounds Buddhist, really, but yeah. everything's so and connected. And you can tell, you know, you talk to any massage therapist or people who have done hands-on work, and you can 
You can get a pretty good idea by just feeling people's structure, you know, what their overall movement and nutrition generally is like, not all the time. Mm -hmm. It just, yeah, it just feels different. Like even doing visceral work sometimes, you're like, huh? Are you sure you don't have any digestive issues? Oh yeah, my digestion's horrible. Okay, yeah, it's all kind of stuck here. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, that you can yeah. actually on a macroscopic level, like you don't need a histology slide to see some of this. You could actually, over the years, like palpate it. You know? Yeah, it just feels different. I mean, you know, people have had uh, like a lot of local inflammation and swelling. You can feel that. Kind of like swelling, adenomous type thing, or you can just do a simple test where you push on the tissue and see how much of it comes back. And, you know, some other tissue, it just doesn't feel firm. It feels kind of boggy, kind of just bleh, <laughs> like it's been fluid filled. <laughs> yikes, yeah. yikes, yeah. All right, well, I guess the take home message for this little bit, and I think we're then we're going to go to break, is, you know, like anything else, try to include fruits and vegetables. Um, you can't. I'm not going to avoid all baked goods and all grilled meats. Yeah. Um, and I, but you know, I might think about, especially during the winter here, stuff like chili and stew might be better choices. Yep. You know, when you can stuff like that. Um, when we come back from the break, we will address this sleep study, and then we're going to talk about, you know, holiday uh, gifts that we personally want <laughs> so you can compare it, <laughs> compare it to your own list <laughs> right yeah right put that out there for everybody <laughs> all right i can't stop feeling some of us don't understand how lucky we are to be living in this Hi listeners, this is Rob Fortress Fortney. I'm here to remind you that as the holiday season approaches and your thoughts turn to giving, we like you to keep Iron Rating in your thoughts. Over the past several years, there have been hundreds of listener comments hoping that Iron Radio stays on the air for years to come. Iron Radio is here for you. But as with any public radio type format, the show is listener supported. That's where you come in. For just $4 a month, you become a supporting member, keeping your weekly dose of education, experts, and gym talk flowing. Just go to www.ironradio.org and click on the $4 monthly subscribe button near the bottom of the page. Or click the donate button at the right of the page for a one-time donation. You are the Iron Brotherhood and Sisterhood. Of course, not everyone can afford to be a supporting member or a significant one-time donor. But for those of you willing to pitch in $4 per month or $50 just once, we're about to sweeten the deal. Become a supporting member or major donor between now and January, and a limited number of you will receive a gift worth over $20. And we will never forget our existing supporters. Simply email me via ironradio.org, and I'll send you a free seminar from Dr. Lowry on how to significantly and realistically boost your testosterone levels. Help your iron brothers and sisters who cannot pitch in but deserve better internet programming in our sports. And happy holidays. Iron Radio is, of course, primarily a podcast. But over the years, there have been technical glitches calling for backup streaming and listeners who wanted the convenience of other sources of audio content. Toward this end, Iron Radio is now simulcast and backed up on YouTube. If needed, please search Lawnman07 or Iron Radio from within YouTube. There's not much video, but if you like to listen through YouTube on a Roku or other living room device, there you go. Okay, listeners, after more than a decade of joining us on the podcast airwaves, you can now also become viewers on YouTube. This is not our usual simple backup of the audio show, but rather a growing body of video taste tests covering various foods of interest to nutrition enthusiasts, bodybuilders, and powerlifters. From within YouTube, simply search for Iron Radio Taste Test or Nutrition Radio Taste Test, in about 15 minutes, we cover taste and texture, similar to other products, uh, usefulness to the co-hosts, and whether we would recommend the product to certain clients. 
You may even want to watch our podcast feed or our Facebook group for which products are coming down the pike so you can taste test them with us. Join us for this new monthly project. Like your weekly fix of Iron Radio? In addition to being a popular institute on iTunes, we are also on email. Simply go to www.ironradio.org and sign up for the voluntary email. You'll get a once per week email, no more, that's little more than the show notes and a link to the audio. So go for it. All right, folks. It's Dr. Nelson and Dr. Lowry, and we are going to be doctory. <laughs> um, we are not physicians, and you guys know that, and not that I would want to be. But we are going to uh, dig into a New York Times article here before we do our, our sort of Christmas list, if you will. Uh, the title was How Foods May Affect Our Sleep. This is by Anahad O'Connor. Uh, I hope I'm not destroying how the pronunciation, but essentially it says this has not been a very good year for sleep because of the pandemic and work stress and all these things. Many people, though, overlook an important factor related to their sleep, which is diet and a growing body of research suggests that the food you eat affect how you sleep and your sleep patterns can then reciprocally affect your dietary choices. Right. So there's, again, this interconnectedness like we were talking about before. It says researchers have found that eating a diet high in sugar, saturated fat, and processed carbs disrupt your sleep. And we're going to talk about the two-edged sword of this, right? Because sometimes you can eat something, like I can tell you, a bowl of cereal and milk before I go to bed will put me down. Um, <laughs> but does it keep you down? You know, that kind of stuff. Um, anyway, so it says eating more essentially fruits, vegetables, right, fiber-containing foods like that. Uh, this says foods rich in unsaturated fat uh, is helpful. Now, it depends on which unsaturate, right? We have monounsaturates, like olive oil is the is really the poster child there. And then we have polyunsaturates, and that could be omega-6, PUFA, right, polyunsaturated fatty acids, or omega-3. And we really should be seeking more of those omega-3 because it's highly unlikely you have an omega-6 deficiency if you live in the West. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Anyway, so they do. He does point out um, such as nuts, olive oil, and avocados, or fatty fish. So there we go. Those may have an opposite effect, helping promote sound sleep. It says much we know, much of what we know about sleep and diet comes from large epidemiological studies. So again, epidemiology just big observational studies where they try to look for correlations. And he does fairly point out these are only correlations; they're not cause and effect. Um, but people who suffer from consistently bad sleep tend to have poor quality diets with less protein and fewer fruits and vegetables and instead rely on a lot of added sugar, uh, especially sugary beverages. So I don't know how many of our listeners are chugging Coke and Mountain Dew and that kind of stuff, but that could be a culprit. It says some of these trials have also been funded by the food industry, again, when they talk about some of the healthier foods. Um, but really either way, and of course that can bias the results. I think any rational adult would would see that. In fact, I read a uh, paper, I'm not going to cite it right now, just this past week that said that uh, something like 50%-ish of industry-funded studies are favorable for the company, uh, whereas when they're not industry-funded, it's a much smaller percentage. Well, I believe that. I believe that too, totally. <laughs> In any case... Because, again, it's not even necessarily a, a, a bold-faced lie. It could just be, you know, you're going to keep digging until you find something interesting in your data set, you know. In any and case. if it's a negative result, the odds of it getting published are very low. Right. Oh, true. Yes. Right. Especially if the company owns the data. Yes. So for all you researchers doing research that's funded, first question to ask is who owns, uh, it? Who owns the data? Yep. <laughs> yep. Um, an example here, 
Studies funded by the cherry industry have found that drinking tart cherry juice can modestly improve sleep in people with insomnia, supposedly through a tryptophan mechanism. Now, I'm not going to go on and read all, every little tidbit of this, but, you know, tryptophan being a, one of the building blocks of melatonin and that sort of thing. Um, but I don't, I don't see how tart cherry would produce, you know, give you grams and grams of tryptophan. I don't know. Um, yeah, I, the, I've only read a couple of those studies, and it did appear to be a true effect, but it was relatively small. Mm -hmm. And at one point, I did kind of trace down where all this funding came from, and I don't know if this is true or not, but one of the cherry producer groups had a lot of this waste product that was left over, and so they started a research group to fund studies to see what they could do with it. <laughs> but that's not always a negative, right? I mean, whey was a waste product from the cheese industry, so sometimes you see some cool stuff come out of it, too. No, it's true. You do. And, in fact, I read another paper, I believe it was in Nature, um, this past week, just doing my morning coffee thing because I'm on, I'm on, you know, winter break right now, uh, and it was kind of suggesting that too. Like industry, I might have been from the IFT, the industry funded mm. studies. You do stumble across some new things. You know, maybe the yeah. sensitivity is real high and not the specificity, right? But you know, maybe pick up something. Um, this article does go on to talk about tryptophan crossing the blood brain barrier, and you know, if you can. If there's other amino acids around competing with tryptophan, maybe you can drive those into muscle tissue and have less competition at the blood-brain barrier for tryptophan. There's always these indirect mechanisms. I'm not going to bore anybody who's not um, a clinician here. Um, it does say the quality of carbs matter. Uh, they can be a double-edged sword when it comes to slumber. And they, they quote this Dr. St. Ange, O-N-G-E, uh, Found in her research that people who eat more sugar and simple carbs, such as white bread, bagels, pastries, and even pasta, wake up more frequently throughout the night. Mm. Um, so it says, in other words, eating carbs may help you fall asleep faster, but you got to focus on the complex carbs, you know, things with maybe a lower glycemic index, whole grain, stuff like that. Uh, it says the relationship between poor diet and bad sleep is also a two way street. Scientists have found that people who, uh, as they lose sleep, they experience physiological changes that then nudge them to seek junk food. Uh, in clinical trials, healthy adults who are allowed to sleep only four to five hours a night tend to snack more, eat more calories, and have more hunger. And then here's a, a gender difference here. In men, sleep deprivation stimulates increased levels of ghrelin, the so-called hunger hormone, while in women, restricting sleep leads to lower levels of GLP-1. And I think hmm. I gave Phil a little infographic of GLP-1. Think of that like a good guy in, in many ways. Uh, so women having lower levels of that, that uh, if they're not sleeping well, uh, you know, it's a satiety hormone, but it does several things. Very interesting stuff. So uh, I dug up one of the papers that this O'Connor guy from the New York Times um, pointed to. And it points to poor sleep quality using the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index. This is from the American Heart Association Go Red for Women study. Uh, women were 20 to 76 years old, 61% racial slash ethnic minority. So it looks like a very broad sample. But the PSQI, and uh, I actually looked at that myself a little bit with coffee and whatnot. Um, here's what they said, at least in this paper. Um, disturbed sleep is highly prevalent among women. Uh, and again, if we look at some of these specifics, higher PSQI scores, which indicate poor sleep quality, were associated with low unsaturated fat intake. Well, again, which unsaturated mm, fat? Yeah. Um, but uh, also high PSQI, again, higher is worse, and more ticks against you, if you will, um, Higher PSQI scores associated with higher food weight uh, and added sugar consumption. So again, pointing at eating more, especially sugary things. It says women with sleep onset latency more than 60 minutes. So if it takes you more than an hour to get to sleep as a woman, had higher intakes of food weight, calories, uh, and less whole grain in the diet than women who basically fell asleep in under 15 minutes when their head hits the pillow. So the conclusion from this, at least this one paper he pointed to, poor sleep quality was associated with greater food intake and a lower quality diet, which can increase cardiovascular disease risk. 
uh, and disturbed sleep highly prevalent in women uh, and associated with higher food and energy intakes. So again, uh, almost like with the, the AGE thing, um, some sex disparities maybe there. Hmm. So Interesting. Mike, I know you know a lot about uh, carbs and diurnal rhythms and all that. Would you mention uh, some studies before we record? Yeah, there was a very interesting um, study here. It is exercise mitigates sleep loss induced changes in glucose tolerance, mitochondrial function, uh, sarcoplasmic protein synthesis, and diurnal rhythms. Uh, the main researcher here is Nicholas uh, Sanner from John uh, Bartlett's lab. Uh, yeah, so what they did is it's, and this kind of goes against what I've actually done with clients, although I've changed it a little bit. Usually if they have a lot of sleep loss, I'm probably going to pull back on their training a little bit. But what they did in this study is they took 24 young healthy males. They had three groups. They had the normal sleep group, which was eight hours for five nights. They had a sleep restriction group, uh, which was four hours in bed for five nights. Mm -hmm. And then they had a sleep restriction group plus exercise. So four hours time in bed uh, for five nights, and they did three high-intensity exercise interval sessions. So what was interesting is the form of exercise they used on it is they did a baseline for VO2 max, and then they had them do 60-second uh, intervals on a bike, a cycle ergometry, at 90% of their peak watts, which is pretty high. And they did 10 rounds of that with 75 seconds rest. So pretty high intensity intervals, but not super long in terms of total duration, right? Mm -hmm. Total work's only going to be about six minutes, but right. pretty yeah. high intensity. And they looked at all sorts of stuff from, you know, how was their sleep patterns to blood glucose to some uh, mitochondrial markers. They did a whole bunch of assays looking at you know, molecular stuff, PGC1 alpha, all that kind of stuff. And what they kind of concluded was, actually, I think, a little at least it was a little bit of a surprise um, to me. They said uh, in the discussion, quote, I discovered that in young, healthy men, sleep restriction resulted in significantly impaired glucose tolerance, concomitant changes in skeletal muscle mitochondrial function, mm -hmm. and sarcoplastic protein synthetic response, which is a marker for mitochondrial protein and diurnal rhythms. Uh, however, in those performing just three sessions of high-intensity exercise intervals with sleep re restriction, uh, these same perturbations were actually not observed. Interesting. Our study provides novel insights, potential mechanisms underlying previously reported changes in glucose tolerance and sleep loss, suggesting that exercise may be used as a therapeutic intervention to attenuate such adverse effects. Um, and again, it was uh, five nights, uh, pretty low sleep, but they only did the exercise, the intervals, uh, 10 of them for 60 seconds on three of the nights. Uh, so it wasn't every night either. So what I, there's a couple other studies from this lab that have looked at that and effect on uh, muscle protein synthesis that appear to be better. Um, so for clients I have that are, you know, I've got some that are physicians, nurses, et cetera, that do a lot of shift work. I've actually, if they have access to a rower or a bike, I've actually programmed them to do a few high intensity intervals to the morning of if they have time or um, after they're kind of coming back. So I try to set it up where it's not going to disrupt their sleep. Just trying to get off, you know, working 12 hours and do intervals is one, just horrible and abysmal. And then two, that's going to potentially mess up your sleep that night. Uh, but if they can do it, even just a few intervals, I think, in the morning before they go to work, whatever time their morning is, in theory, may uh, be better for metabolic health and may kind of keep their gains on track. You know, that's, yes, it's population specificity, but that is fascinating, right? So yeah, if it's intense enough, it's almost a partial replacement for sleep, for freaking sleep. Yeah, you know? especially I for the metabolic issues, yeah. Wow. Well, yeah, and they, I mean, they, they cut their sleep from eight to four, you know, for five nights. And, you know, those earlier work on that's been done by, I think it was the University of Chicago, Illinois, where, yeah, you could take healthy people, you know, cut their sleep from eight to four hours a night. And within a few nights, they're like borderline diabetic. 
Unreal. So. Yeah. I, th- we talked about this a bit a year or two ago. I had a, a student who was a competitive cyclist and really quite good. Mm-hmm. Um, and we tried to knock him out of glucose homeostasis with, with uh, three nights of really bad sleep. In fact, one night he just decided to stay up completely. <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> and and his his blood sugars um, and like response to a carb challenge and everything normal, yeah, just normal. Now I get I get that's only a couple of days and a lot of this is chronic. You've talked about that with HRV in the yeah. past. Like one night does not make or break you, but the idea that our population now let's be honest with ourselves. I don't mean. You know, you went down and did uh, a couple of mild metabolic sets of some negatives in your basement because that's what I've been doing this past week while I put my flooring in. You know, that's not the same thing as getting intense and purposely exercising for a dedicated amount of time. But, yeah, yeah, the idea that that can actually partly replace sleep is freaking amazing. It's just one more reason to to train. (laughs) Yeah, and especially I wonder, too, about just that higher – intensity glycolytic type work whether you're doing it on a rower or on a bike it's just it's so different i think even the more i learn just from weight training i mean i think they're very similar in terms of mechanisms but i I still think there's something different going on because you've got that high intensity output for you know 60 seconds again i like using the rower a lot because people can just tell me what their wattage was so I know exactly what their their power output was. Right. They don't have to do anything extra to figure it out. Yeah. It just tells you. Yep. Um, and if you row slower, your wattage is just lower. So I always kind of know where they're at online. But I think there's just something unique about that high output for 30, 60 seconds and doing that on a repeated fashion. That's just a, a different stimulus. Right on. Okay. But, um, we're almost out of time, but let's at least... We always go over when it's me and Mike, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, let's Bonus. let's yeah. Let's do the the topic here, um, just for even if it's just for ten or fifteen minutes about what you want for the holidays, uh, Christmas or you know, pick your favorite holiday here. Um, is there anything on your list, supplement wise, equipment wise? I mean, being an engineer, you're a gadget oriented and. Um, what, what are some of your thoughts? And again, people can l- compare this to their list. This is not, <laughs> this is not a call to our 25,000 ish <laughs> listeners. Hey, buy Mike and Lonnie, hey, these things, send us cool stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but you can compare it to your own lists, uh, everybody. Uh, but what do you think, Mike? What's, what's looking attractive to you? And you can use holiday as an excuse to. Yeah. Obtain. Yeah. I'm a Christian. So we celebrate Christmas and everything. Um, just usual stuff I like. Um, good coffees, always at the, the top of the list. And I've been playing around more with collagen pre-training again. Um, so I've been doing a morning, uh, most days, aerobic session. But I've added some other accessory rotational work and you know th- movements that I probably should get just as a good human being <laughs> in for 10, 15 minutes. So I'll use some collagen, 15 grams, about 40 to 60 minutes before. That's based on some of Keith Barr and Dr. Shaw's work. Mm-hmm. Um, other than that, for supplements, that's probably been about it. I I may try. I always say I'm going to do this, and I never do it. I may try baking soda again as an ergogenic before some yeah. uh, heinous animals. Mm-hmm. Every time I try it, I just feel so crappy. I just the thought of even as I'm saying this now is it probably just not going to happen. <laughs> 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 uh, I'm, the different experiments like that that I want to run uh, in a perfect world at some point, uh, it'd be nice to get a way to measure uh, f- basically flow or potentially do some uh, respiratory muscle training. So there's a device in Europe that can measure that. It's kind of like a Spyro Tiger, uh, but the things are st- stupid expensive, like $1,200. Oh. I don't know if I spend that just to see yeah. if respiratory muscle training works. And yeah, so yeah, yeah. that's pretty far down on the list. Other stuff I had, uh, potentially CEU's approval for the Flex Diet Cert. We we're talking about that off air. It's been, a, we'll say, more than a, a pain in the butt, but hopefully that'll come through at some point. And then I did order some stuff uh, early Christmas to myself with some new fun grip stuff. Uh, so shout out to uh, Lucas from uh, Arm Assassins. He has some really great stuff. I had clients pick up uh, something from him called the Saxon Bar. 
So if you imagine it's like a metal two by six that you can add weight on the end. Okay. So when you pick it up, you have to do a pinch grip. So your hands are kind of flat oh, and extended. Yes. And really hard. But I got this tip from my buddy Adam Glass, who's been on the show here before. But it's a great way to overload your hands in that extended position, high finger stress, high thumb stress. Yeah. Uh, because it's a deadlift position, your grip's going to be the main limiter on that. Um, uh, yeah, so it's been fun. I picked up some stuff from him. I got a uh, rackable camber bar, which will be fun since I'm trying to work more on squats now that I'm at home. I got something from him called a, a, it's called a monster curl bar. So imagine like you've got a bar, but you're holding on to it like a hammer position and there's no top on it and you can get an oversized like two inch pipe on it. So you have to hold like a two inch pipe in a hammer position, but you can weight it. So now you have to hold your grip and, you know, do a hammer type curl with it. A uh, couple other things from him, do some pronation, supination, you know, radial ulnar deviation, stuff like that. And then, yeah, so those are kind of the the main items so far. I'll tell you, some of that, the grip stuff, and I know I'd, we, I'd be ripped on by you and a lot of people for this, but I find it kind of frustrating. Like, to me, pinch grip oh, is hard. moving around 10-pound <laughs> and, and 25-pound plates, you know. Um, that's kind of like on the ends of my curl bars. You know, that's when I consciously pinch grip things, you know. Oh, sure. Um, you know, the plates that are more flat as opposed to they have a lip on them kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, Oh geez, yeah. That's but and and yet I get it. I what really stuck in my mind, just learning from a lot of you guys on this stuff is if you have a monster grip, self defense alone, it's huge, right? Like someone oh, yeah. flails around, you grab them, they're immobilized and they're not getting away. Whereas most people, they can uh, they can violently pull out of your grip. But if you're like in a wrestling kind of situation, forget it, man. You know, you're you're a a virtual you know crab or lobster. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, the analogy I use too is that if you've ever done the reverse, uh, even if you don't have like fat grips or a two inch axle bar or anything, just take your normal one inch diameter bar, start doing all your deadlifts double overhand, and you'll notice that when you get to the amount where you can feel it, you can't really hold it. You just don't feel strong. And then you do the opposite of, you know, where your grip is stronger and you pick up the bar. You're like, oh, yeah, today's going to be a good day. Yeah. So usually you, you have that just that secure, you know, attachment to the bar. So I think there's a bigger transfer than what most people realize. And the benefit is, you know, most people don't have to be a, a grip athlete or do that as their main training. For a lot of clients, I just add in a little bit of thick bar work here and there, a little bit of pinch stuff, some thumb work. And that's usually enough just to kind of keep it going so that it doesn't ever become like a super big limiter for him. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I, this reminds me of ages ago, Fortress would say stuff like, you know, because I would always do double overhand stuff like deadlifts because I just feel it more in my traps. I mean, remember, I'm thinking like oh, yeah. bodybuilding and hypertrophy and everything. And it just felt good. It felt better that way. And Fortress used to be like, for strength, bro, step number one, squeeze the shit out of that barbell. You know, yeah, because uh, it just sends the message all the way up to your brain, like strong, you know, um, so it's like yeah. wisdom. And a tip with that, too, is that because your double overhand is going to be a limiter more so than your deadlift or your back, even if you're on a one inch bar, uh, you can start with a lightweight. And then as you grip the bar, tilt your forearms actually out a little bit. So you're getting as much of your palm on the bar as you can and then try to wrap your pinky as far far around as possible and then put your thumb on the outside of your index so but just by getting a little bit more of that surface area on the bar because your weight is going to be sub max of what your max deadlift is that can help too now there's a gold nugget i'm going to try that that's a nice little tip yeah it makes a big difference right so i guess from my buddy adam if you look at axle work where you're really sub max of what your deadlift is i'll actually have a fair amount of start at um bend my elbows most people are like, what? But when you do that, you can get more surface area of your hand onto the bar, especially an axle where it's two inches and you can't get your thumb around to your index. Yeah. Um, and just that little bit of difference. Uh, yeah, it helps quite a bit. Sweet. That's a good tip. Yeah. What's uh, on your list, Lonnie? Um, Supplement-wise, 
I'm out of creatine, so maybe some of my stocking. That's um, a good one. I'm still interested. Uh, I, I've gone through one bottle, and I'm cheap because it's 90 bucks a bottle, but that true niagen, that yeah, nicotinamide riboside. Yeah, Kelly and I split it. Um, and so we do it every other day just to make it last because it's just like a 120-count bottle or whatever. But um, that whole NR stuff, you know, it's supposed to be more right. efficient than NMN. I don't know. Um, but there's enough data. We've talked about this before. I'm, you know – I'm, I'll probably get a bottle of that. Like I said, for 90 bucks, oh, and I'm underdosing. But, you know, especially because, I mean, I'm 52. And so yeah. I, I, it's time for me. I think, honestly, your 50s are that time where you're really – I know a lot of this stuff is, takes decades. But when things start to fall apart, you know, prostate and joints and everything else, I would like to try to um, not age as quickly. And I'm not going to do it by not eating. <laughs> So, yeah. <laughs> so the NAD boosting as far as, Oral you know, token. yeah, anti-cancer effects, all that. That's on my list. Um, I am interested in city choline uh, yeah. as far as a nootropic. So um, I don't think he listens to this show, but uh, I'll probably look into some of that for uh, my son. He's interested in nootropic type stuff. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, yeah, um, Jack Owak's new stuff, New Red Line, apparently has that uh, – and adding that to an energy drink, I think, is really smart, actually. So, yeah. uh, city choline. Mm-hmm. That's going to be in everything this next year, is my prediction, yeah. because it's one of the very few nootropics that actually has any pretty good data on it. Like Renshaw is one of the main researchers on it. But uh, for people looking, make sure you check the label amount of what's in it, because, like most things in the supplement industry, They'll take all the really good data and then they'll just underdose the shit out of it. Because oh, it's expensive. right. <laughs> yeah. We, how many times do we like, you know, you, you consult with a supplement company or something. You're like, you're, you're basing that on price point of the bottle, not effective dose, you know. Exactly. Yeah. In fact, I think that was um, Sean Casey's big thing, you know, with his yeah. company startup. Like, here's a novel idea. How about we dose things based on effect? <laughs> yeah. A novel idea. Right. <laughs> Um, I'm also interested, increasingly interested, and I know we need to do more on uh, you know, fungi and whatnot, but a lion's mane yeah. and stuff yes. like that. Uh, really interesting nootropic stuff. So those are some kind of wish listy things. As far as equipment goes, uh, I'm constantly blowing out the seams in my elbow sleeves, and I need elbow sleeves at, at my age. Like I can see why Phil is interested in experimenting with gear now, you know, because he's in oh, his mid forties. Sure. You know, and if joints are the limiting factor, just compression alone just seems to help so much. So I need to get ones that don't blow out because I keep blowing out the ones along the seams. Um, I still, if anybody, any of our listeners have a suggestion, I bet Phil does, but I have never found a knee sleeve that I could wear like a whole training session. Maybe Mm. they just don't. They always seem to roll down or sag down somehow. And if I make them too tight, I I don't know. I, I I'm open to suggestions for knee sleeves. The elbow sleeves I've got down pretty well, except they don't last. Um, You know, one thing our listeners might laugh, especially the real strong ones, but I have dumbbells at home downstairs because I haven't gone to the gym um, since March, right? So I'm I'm just lifting at home because of the pandemic. Um, I was thinking about literally donating to Pep at the gym just because – no, I don't want anything from you, man. I just want you to stay afloat when I come yeah, back. Yeah, be there when it's done. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I have 10-pound increment dumbbells, and sometimes I need those five, the, the half increment. You, you might think of what, what's the deal, you know, that should be enough. That's the basics. But I just find that, like, if I want to do high rep stuff with, like, you know, dumbbell curls or reverse curl type things, hammer curls, yeah. 35s kind of fit that gap between the 30 the 30s and the 40s that i have or the 40s and the 50s so those five pound increment dumbbells flushing out my my range if you will it seemed superfluous really when i first created my home gym but no i'm thinking yeah that kind of matters so can, can you still get the old magnetic plate mates where you would stick them on the end That would be like one to two and a half pound increments, I think. Yeah, I might play with something like that. I've got hex dumbbells downstairs. Um, Okay. But but, no, I hear you. I hear you. And, you know, I got a little dumbbell rack last Christmas, so I've got room on it. So maybe I will. Oh, nice. Maybe I will. I might get heavier ones, too. 
Like my dumbbells at home only go up to 60s because you can do a lot with 60 pound dumbbells. Um, oh yeah. But I might grab a pair of 70s or 80s. We'll see. Um, and then this is a long shot that may or may not happen in 2021. Probably not yet. But I still want a CGM watch, like an Apple Watch or something that's not not prescription. You know, doesn't require any kind of really attention from me, but something that continually looks at my blood sugars. I really think we're on the tip of that. Uh, it might not be 2021. Like I said, maybe it's three years away. I don't know. But yeah. once a lot of these biometric gadgets start looking at blood sugar or maybe, you know, extrapolating from some kind of interstitial fluid or whatever it is, um, I want one. <laughs> but I, I, that's, alas, that's probably not, not going to be this holiday season. Yeah. Because then it can do all sorts of auto-generated stuff that I have to kind of do by hand if I've got someone who's got a CGM or that type of data of, you know, cross-checking into your resting heart rate and HRV to look for stress to see how much does it go down with, you know, movement. And if it syncs to your MyFitnessPal or chronometer, then it can pull in automatically what your carbohydrate load was. And so... Now you get both stimulus and response, which is super fascinating. Oh, it is. In fact, that's what um, we're going to present one poster probably next year because there aren't any <laughs> good live conferences. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, and what we're what we've got now is we're sitting on data that we're analyzing right now, and it's curvilinear, so it's it's you can't just run general linear model stats on it, but uh, HRV and carb. Uh, you know, a glucose tolerance test and linking those two things, Mike, you're well aware of this, but yeah. um, uh, to your, again, to your point, like what does coffee do to your autonomic nervous system? And then how does that impact your blood sugar? Cause there's a lot of stuff in the news right now. Don't drink coffee until after breakfast. And Ugh. I get it a uh, kind of, you know, because yes, coffee has caffeine and that will very temporarily mess with your, the glucose curve from breakfast, but maybe it will. Um, but I don't think I'm going to have a bunch of dry breakfast and then have my coffee. <laughs> yeah. So, it, you know, whatever. So, yeah, but that's just some simple things on my list. I'm pretty just grateful for what I've got. You know, I've got a gym set up at home. Yeah. It's nothing that I'm going to film and put online and, you know, Instagram it. <laughs> but it's it gets the work done, you know, three times a week. I can go downstairs. and You don't really need that much, honestly. Uprights, you know, uh, a utility bench with an incline on it, you can get a lot done, a lot done, just yeah. barbell. I mean, I had uh, here for years, I also did the RKC kettlebell for a while. I was an assistant there for a couple of years, but I had just a full set of kettlebells I'd take outside all the time, and that was good. And then I got just a old cheap sports authority bar and a, just a couple pounds of used weights. I didn't even have a rack. I had a three-quarter inch farm stall mat. Yeah, but then you could do like, floor presses if you could kind of prop it up into a position you could do deadlifts you could do military press you could do a, a fair amount of stuff without even having a rack and then once i uh, had a rack and you know added more and more stuff to it it's yeah but you can start with some you know, some basic stuff and just kind of build from there yep all right well we have gone over <laughs> as we are wont to do yeah well, so happy holidays, everybody. Hanukkah, yes. whatever whatever you're into, Kwanzaa. I'm all about all of these things because of the, you know, you're a good actor by being interested in these things on some level. You know, it's well-wishing and, and that sort of thing. Um, and I guess we'll just check back in um, once Phil gets back from his family vacation. And um, we'll see you next week. See you. Iron Radio is accepting donations. If you like what we do, the professors, the scientists, the bodybuilding show promoters, the athletes themselves in powerlifting and bodybuilding, um, please consider making a donation or maybe buying something from the ironradio.org uh, store. Uh, we also are accepting supporting members. So for $4 a month, which is frankly less than the bank sneaks out of your account in fees, you can step up and support a form of sort of public radio for the bodybuilding and powerlifting and strength community. The Iron Radio podcast and all of the audio on ironradio.org is for informational purposes only. If you're interested in starting a diet or exercise program, it's important to check with your physician. 
also seek the help of registered dietitians, athletic trainers, and qualified exercise physiologists in order to make the progress that you need.